Our subject this morning, for the benefit of those who listen on the internet, is how did man become a sinner? And is man a sinner? We're going to endeavor to show from the scripture that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Let's stand together for the scripture reading is printed in your bulletin. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. And you hath he quickened, that word means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and in sins. Among whom also we all had our conversation, that means our manner of life, in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherever he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Thank you. Be seated, please. What do we mean by saying that man is a sinner? And what does total depravity mean? Total depravity is taught in the Scripture. And it is a state of being in which man is described as spiritually dead. He can be physically alive, but spiritually dead. The word depravity comes from the Latin word, two words actually. The first one is de, which means thoroughly, thoroughly. And the second is pravos, which means crooked, spiritually dead. And all persons who come into this world by natural birth, come into this world spiritually dead because of Adam's sin. There's a story that goes like this. It's called I, I, The Irishman's Turtle. There were two Irishmen who caught a turtle and they thought they would cut his head off, cook him, and have some turtle soup. And so they chopped off his head and the turtle just kept walking around. And uh, Mike said he's dead because his head's cut off. And the other one said, no, he's alive because he's walking around. And they got in a big argument whether the turtle was dead or not. And a man was walking past and they called him over and said, we're having an argument, will you settle it for us? Is this turtle dead or alive? I believe he's dead because his head's been cut off. But my friend here believes he's alive because he's walking around. What say you, sir? The man looked at the turtle for 
for a few moments. He said, well, I'll tell you. He's dead, but he doesn't know it. <laughs> now that is the state of the unsaved. They are dead, but they do not know it. And they never know it until they pick up a Bible and read the Bible or go and hear a preacher tell them that the Bible says they're dead. And so we preach to the living and the dead. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, by sin, fell from their original righteousness in communion with God being dead in sin and wholly defiled in all faculties and parts of their soul and body. Man has lost communion with God. He died spiritually when Adam died. And he began dying physically the day he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All men's faculties are depraved. That's why we call it total depravity. Depravity is evil raised to the highest level. It's bad. If you turn on your internet or your television, out in California, you see nothing but murder and mayhem, bloodshed, people stabbing one another on the streets, children being shot in their schools, yeah. that ought to be enough evidence to convince anybody that man is a totally depraved creature. Every part of his nature was polluted and converted and corrupted when Adam sinned against God by aiding of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. His mind and understanding became darkened his affections were perverted by the power of sin. His will was brought into the bondage of sin. So man is not free. Adam was born and brought into this world by creation. And he thinks that he is the master of his own life. He thinks that he knows best for what he ought to do or not to do. Man is a depraved creature. He denies God's sovereignty over him. And he walks about physically alive, but spiritually dead, having never been converted yet to Christ. Now we do not teach that man is as bad as he can be. There are degrees of sin. For instance, murder is worse than stealing. There are degrees of sin, but all disobedience and all wrongdoing is sin. And you don't have to do a lot of sin to go to hell. If you reject salvation, if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ, you will go to hell. If you receive Him as your personal Savior, you will go to heaven. Amen. It's so simple. It all depends on where you stand in reference to our Lord Jesus Christ and His death upon the cross. Now, total depravity means the extent of his depravity in all of his faculties, mind, body, and soul. Not the degree of depravity. There is no part of man that has not been touched by total depravity. God looks down from heaven upon men. He sees them lost in sin. He sees them totally depraved. And he has become a judge over all mankind, which will take place on the judgment day. However, in the next four lessons, I'm going to show you how God has balanced the fall of man 
with the, another man who did not fall, the Lord Jesus Christ. For instance, sometimes men think that because they've not murdered anyone or because they've not done some outstanding sin, that they're pretty much all right with God. But if they've never trusted Christ, never repented of their sins, never been born again, they are not right with God and cannot be right with God until that takes place in their life. For instance, man was totally affected by the fall of Adam. If you take a glass of water and you pour one drop of ink into that glass of water, it will permeate the entire glass of water. It won't just stay where it landed on the water. It will permeate all through the water. And that's what we mean by total depravity. Man is permeated by sin in his nature, in his heart, in his mind. He has this permeation of sin in him. And he cannot get rid of it himself. Every man by nature a child of wrath. He drinks iniquity like water. Job chapter 15. He is depraved in mind. Ephesians 4.17 He is blinded in heart. Ephesians 4.18 He cannot hear the words of Christ. John 8.43 He cannot know the things of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 he cannot please God, Romans chapter 8 and verse 8. He cannot do anything but become a slave to Satan. There are 12 great descriptions of the fall of Adam and what happened to him and what happens to all men who came from him. Number one, Mankind, through the fall of Adam, is now marked by darkness. Romans chapter 1. He has no power to receive light. Ephesians 4, 17. He has an evil mind. Genesis 6, 5. He is at war with God. Romans 8, 6 and 7. He is incapable of receiving the truth. 1 Corinthians 2, 14. He has a reprobate mind. Romans 1.28 He is empty. Ephesians 4.17 He is carnal. Romans 8.7 He is conceited. Romans 12.3 He is defiled. Titus 1.15 He is blinded. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. And He is characterized by death. Romans 8.6 now those are all Bible scriptures that I just gave you. Twelve of them in which God gives us His description of the state of man in Adam. That's in Adam. That's the state of the natural man. Now there's two kinds of men mentioned in the Bible. There's the old man and there's the new man. Right. In conversion you become a new man. Amen. And the old man continues to struggle within you, but he cannot win. The new man wins out. Now, if you do not obey the Word of God, if you do not go to church, if you do not read the Bible, if you do not pray, the old man is going to take over in your life. Right. If you're converted, truly saved, then the new man will lead you in the right paths. You'll go to church. You'll read the Bible. you love the Lord. And so on. So you're either a new man in Christ or an old man in Adam. There are two Adams mentioned in the Bible. The first Adam, the man that God created in the Garden of Eden, and the new man, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came down from heaven as a new man. He's always been a new man. I come to my second point.
How did man become depraved? God has just given us a, an awful description of the man, the natural man. How did he get in that state that he could have all those bad things said about him by God? We have to go back to the book of Genesis and chapter 2, beginning with verse 7, to get the answer to that question. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. No evolution there. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, and the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now I'm jumping over to verse 15 of chapter 2. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. That word keep it there means to guard it. Guard it against who? Satan. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Now God made this beautiful eat. It was the most luxurious orchard anyone had ever seen. And he was told that he had free reign to eat any of the trees that he wanted to in the Garden of Eden except one. There was one that he was forbidden to eat of. And that is called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now Adam had been warned, If you eat of that tree, you will die. Now he had been warned. He knew the penalty. And his wife listened to Satan's story and Satan's lie. And she went ahead and ate of the tree. She knew better. But she listened to Satan's lie. Right. There's a lot of women in the world today that are listening to Satan's lie. There's a lot of men that are listening to Satan's lie. Satan will lie to you because he wants to deceive you and get you lost and in his clutches and drag you down into hell with him. Don't listen to Satan's lies. Amen. Believe the Bible. Now Adam was not created in a state of neutrality and innocence as some people teach. He was not innocent, but created in the image of God. Ephesians 4.24 tells us that God did not create a sinner. Ephesians 4.24 and that He put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. God created a man called him Adam but He did not create a sinner. Adam chose to become a sinner by his disobedience to God. Satan using the subtlety of the serpent to subdue Eve and then her subduing and seducing Adam who without any compulsion did wildly and willfully transgress the law of their creation. Our first parents by this sin fell into their clutches. Original righteousness and communion with God and we fell in them. There's a little poem that goes like this. In Adam's fall, 
we fell all. That's true. When Adam fell in the Garden of Eden, I fell in Adam because I was in Adam. And you were in Adam. We were all in Adam. He is the first man that God ever created. And all of his posterity were in him. And when God said, if you sin, you will die, he was saying to Adam, all your posterity will die in you. In you. You are the head of creation. I have made you and created you to be the headship over mankind. And you are to obey and all of your posterity will obey. Now, if you want to trace your ancestry, you can do that. The Mormons make a lot of money tracing people's ancestry. And you can write to them and give them the information you have. And they'll do a search. And they'll send you back a paper and tell you all who your ancestors were. But I can do that this morning and do it free. Your ancestors go all the way back to Adam. Because Adam, the Bible says, was the first man. If he was the first man, there wasn't any second man. He was the first man of creation. He created Adam. So Adam is the federal head of the human race. We were all in Adam. And the story is this. God says, Adam, if you stand, your posterity will all stand in you and with you. But if you fall, all of your posterity will die in you. As you are going to die for your sin, so they will all die in you. Therefore, when I was brought into this world by my mother, I was brought into this world still born. Not literally, not <laughs> medically, but I was still born. I brought, was brought into this world a sinner dead in trespasses and sins. And I stayed that way for 20 some years until I went to hear a Baptist preacher preach the gospel and I heard the truth and I learned to know the second man from heaven, Amen. the Lord Jesus. Amen. That I was a sinner. And I wrote a little poem to myself. I looked in the mirror, and what did I see? I saw a sinner, just like me. I looked again in the mirror, and what did I see? I saw that sinner was me. Have you ever looked in the mirror of God's Word and seen yourself as God has described you? Well, that's the first step of salvation. You can't go any further. You can't get to God unless you come with this first step. And that is to acknowledge to God that you have sinned against Him, that you deserve to go to hell, but because you want to be saved from your sins, you are repenting of your sins, you are trusting Jesus Christ to save you. This is the first step. If you miss this step, you will miss the other four you'll miss the other four. This is the beginning, the very beginning of a man's salvation. It is for him to acknowledge to God, I am a sinner. I am depraved. I am wicked. I am defiled. Lord, that's me. God is speaking about me. When you do that, you're on your way to be insane because no unsaved man will do that and if he does that it means he's taking that first step he knows he's a sinner he confesses it to God and he asks God's forgiveness that's what we're trying to do this morning
see, you can't get people saved until you get them lost. Right. They've got to get lost before they Amen. can get saved. And so, this is the first step. If you're here today and you've never been saved, then you need to take this step. Lord, I am a sinner. I confess it. I admit it. I'm sorry for it. And I want you to change my life. That's the first step. That's what I want to give you this morning. I'm going to give you a lot of scripture because I want you to thoroughly understand what happened in the Garden of Eden and what it has to do with you personally. You see, when Adam took that tree and ate of it, you took that tree and ate of it. When Adam plucked that fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you put it in your mouth and you ate it in disobedience to God because everything Adam did was credited to your account and that's why everything that Jesus did on the cross is credited to your account and blanks out your sin. There's two imputations. Now, to get the doctrinal content of that fall in Adam, let's go back to Romans chapter 5. If you have your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 5 and we'll begin reading with verse 12. Romans chapter 5, beginning with verse 12. This is the doctrinal explanation of Adam's fall and of our fall in Adam. And as you read this, and you see what happened to Adam, remember it happened to you too because you were in Adam. Verse 12, Romans 5. Wherefore, by the way, Notice this word, one man. One is found 12 times in this chapter. 12 times. And God's not in the habit of repeating himself. When he says it 12 times, it's a call to look, stop, look, and listen. And here we go, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, who is that one man? Adam. Sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So death passed upon all men, for that all had sinned. You see, when death passed upon Adam in the garden, it also passed upon all men, all his posterity. Every child, every grandchild, every great-grandchild, and you go on back till you get to Adam. Verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that is to come. The figure of him that is to come is Christ. Now verse 15 but not as the offense, as Adam's offense, so also is the free gift. Salvation's a free gift. For if through the offense of one, that's Adam's offense against God, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man. There's only one man that can give you salvation. Only one man that can save you. Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. And not, verse 16, as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Verse 17, for if by one man's offense, now here is how you became a sinner. If by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more, that was Adam, much more they that receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Verse 18, Therefore, 
as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men. It came on me, it came on you, it came on everybody. It's a judgment of total depravity. Came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, that's Christ, the free gift came upon all men under justification of life. Notice that. Justification of life is a free gift by one man. And that's not Adam. That's Christ. Verse 19, 4. This is an explanatory statement. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, Christ, shall many be made righteous. Christ takes the sinner and makes him righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace, grace did much more abound that as sin hath reigned like a king unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Here is the doctrinal explanation of Genesis 3. The doctrinal explanation of Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, you have the headship of Adam, that all men were in Adam, and all men fell in Adam. But here is justification of life by one man, the Lord Jesus Christ, who takes the repenting sinner, puts his arms around him, and takes him into the family of God. That's the second justification, the justification of life. And it is not of death. Now in the fourth place, in the third place, the sinner's condition. How bad is total depravity? I'm going to give you God's word on it. This is not what I say or think. This is what the Bible says. And you can believe every word of it. First of all, total depravity is a matter of divine revelation. Man's understanding is to pray. Romans 3.11 There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Ephesians 4.18 Man's will is to pray. Jesus said, Ye will not come to me that you might have life. Sinners could have life if they would come to Jesus. But if they don't come to Him, they won't have life. Man's will is to pray. His will is not free. He was created with a free will, but He lost it when He sinned. And He lost it for you, and He lost it for me. And only Jesus could give it back to us. Then his affections are depraved. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. That they might all be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. 2 Thessalonians 2.12 Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us.